start off by asking our panelists what distinguishes the strongest candidates for positions at your company? And what would you say distinguishes uh, the best, most high performing young employees as our audience is thinking about what they need to develop now to gain entry? I'd just love to hear impressions on that topic. Anyone? Okay, if I can start since I'm holding a microphone. Um, I think there is actually, the, the question's interesting because distinguishing a candidate versus the performance of someone who's, once they're in the organization, can be quite different. So for me, when you say the part of a candidate, it's more about how you communicate your skill set, your capabilities, the prospects of what you're looking for and what you want to achieve. That doesn't necessarily mean you're always going to be the best performing once you're inside the organization. That's a different skill set. Um, so I kind of segregate the salesmanship of getting a job somewhat different from once you've committed yourself and you've integrated yourself into the organization and you've learned how to succeed over the long term and build a career within the organization. Um, and although as much as we may try to test you on as much of the success factors as possible during the interview, um, some people are very well practiced at just communicating the right answer. Um, and they may perform very differently once they get in the organization. And that's why there has to be a strong link between our recruiting function as well as our talent management function. Um, because those are, they, they can't really be separated. The decision to bring someone in and the strengths and weaknesses of that person should ultimately drive the curriculum and the support they get to succeed as professional. So that we can fill in whatever gaps there are that we didn't pick up in the first place um, and address any concerns that we may identify early on. I would agree um, with that. I think one of the really important skills that we try and actually get um, both our uh, candidates to do, um, whether it's through our internship program and also new graduates into the, the company as well, is actually that self-analysis piece. So actually making sure that you're really self-aware about actually what your skills are, but also where are the areas that you need to develop. And those shouldn't be things which stop you from being put forward for a role, but at least you're already identifying areas that a company will then know about that they need to be investing in for you. So although I'm EDF trading is much smaller than, than Nomura, so we wouldn't necessarily have a, a specific curriculum that would already be set out for you, but if you're already doing that as part of identifying what you need to be successful in your career, then we can help with that. Thanks. I think I'd like to reflect a bit further on Malcolm's comments, actually, about there being two distinct kind of skill sets between the person who is actually presenting themselves at the assessment centre and what they have to say and do, and then the reality of performance in the workplace. I once presented to a head of trading at a previous employer who said to me, OK, thank you for all these competencies and all these requirements that HR are telling us that we need from people applying to us, but I'm not going to read them. I'm not going to look through them because there's only three things that I'm looking for. And he boiled it down to, is the person smart, is the person hardworking, and is the person human? And the smart bit, we've got lots of evidence of in your application. That's not difficult. The hard working bit, again, we have lots of extracurricular activities and achievements that help us to measure that. The bit we can't get to is, are you human? And for us, that's the differentiator. And what do we mean by human? Well, by human, we're really looking at things around cultural fit, perhaps. Will the individual fit in with our team? Will the team like them? Will they fit in with clients? Will clients like them? But overall, and, uh, I think far reaching at that is, is the person, and this sounds a really weird thing to say, is the person genuinely interested for us in investment banking? And the only way you can really convey that is, well, one through your application form, but one when you come to the assessment centre, is being aware of the particular team or the particular product line or particular area that the company that you've applied to is doing and have that extra knowledge on top of the obvious website stuff because that shows interest and if interest is a proxy for genuine passion about working in that part of the business that will be one of the differentiators 
Um, so with that in mind, I'd like to ask you if you could describe a bit what the partnership between employees and your firm is like with respect to how you help people to learn and develop. What is it that our students can expect a firm will offer them what sorts of services, what sorts of programs may be in place, and what is really their responsibility in terms of identifying opportunities and looking for ways to contribute to the maximum and to develop themselves as much as they can? I think uh, like many large organizations, we will have large frameworks and teams of people dedicated to giving you initial training programs, providing continuing education curriculums um, for you to choose from depending on which business area you're in. But I think the one recurring theme you're probably going to get from every organization is that it keeps coming back to you, the individual, to figure out A, how much time you're going to commit to it, B, is it the right track for you, how do you balance that with on-the-job training and spending more time with the people you work with and probing and asking them about how to handle situations and develop new skills and what you should be focused on um, and learning from others around you. I think at BNP Paribas and certainly a, a number of organizations now, and this is I think across Europe and, and beyond, the days of bringing many, many graduate or new entrants to the firm together for four, five, sometimes six weeks of very intensive training, and I've been involved in designing some of those programs, I think those days are going to be largely behind us. I think what we're looking at now is much more of a breakdown of looking at training skills, if you like, and dividing them up between what business skills do you need to have, not soft skills, and we've banned the phrase soft skills at BNP Paribas because they're not soft. They can be very hard at times, but they're essential for, for conducting business. So looking at business skills, looking at the technical skills that you need, and also getting a sense of community. We still recognize it's important for people to feel part of a class of people who've joined at a particular time. Uh, we are here as a finance crowd, so if I try to give a few figures um, to illustrate uh, in a different way what is the what is the sponsorship uh, we do have with the employee as far as uh, developing them. Um, for young employees, it's probably uh, the first year, probably 100 uh, hours a year training. Um, and over five years, I would tend to say roughly it's uh, between 400 and uh, 500 uh, uh, hours uh, as a total of uh, mostly uh, I would say being sim a bit simplistic, mandatory training. Um, so we have designed programs that are that aimed at uh, inside or off-site uh, on a country basis first and then uh, gradually uh, when people uh, tend to get a little more experience within those five years where those training tend to, to be uh, European training or worldwide trainings. Uh, what advice do you have uh, for young employees to identify opportunities for learning. You've mentioned uh, some structured programs, you've mentioned some, some mentoring, some networking types of activities that people can engage in. What is the, the range of valuable learning opportunities that you see happening in your firms and how do young employees develop a mindset of really identifying those key ways that they can learn and align themselves with the firm's needs? Now, one of the things that we have to grapple with is that within investment banking, you are rewarded for specialism and expertise. So as you become more and more niche and more and more expert, you get paid more and more, but also you become perhaps quite siloed in your way of thinking. Now, one of the things that we're trying to do to help people break out of that actually at work is running a series of um, lunchtime events. These are for 30 to 40 minutes where people from right across our fixed income, our global equities, our commodities and derivatives functions come together to talk about different parts of their recent deal portfolio, if you like. Everyone's invited, everyone gets to hear about what's actually been happening, and it helps people to understand or just keeps reinforcing where the different parts of the business actually help in the execution of a trade, for example, or how a relationship that perhaps started off in the private bank or investment management 
grows into part of the investment bank and perhaps grows into investment solutions and the middle and back office as well. So trying to get that notion of let's share more information about the whole entity and what it does and hopefully through doing that, one, make cross-selling easier, but two, also help people within their own individual parts of the business understand what skills and what activities are going on in other parts of the business. When you're thinking about actually being self-aware and developing, actually, you have to think slightly outside of the box as well. So there's a very traditional model for progression, so, you know, kind of at a management route or a technical route, but actually within EDF trading, there are, of course, those opportunities, but there are actual... Um, they can be quite few because of then the size of the teams that are there. So we'd have to then think about actually outside of the box, so thinking maybe potentially are there opportunities to progress internationally or into a different function where there might be some skills that are shared and actually then broadening your technical knowledge there. Um, but one of the other things I think is part of our responsibility is to make sure that the people you're working for also are understanding the giving and receiving feedback process, right? So as much as I can structure a whole lot of things on paper around what you should be doing for your career and what steps you should be taking, if you're not getting feedback, you actually are probably not going to be as adept at that self-evaluation process on whether or not you're on the right track and at the right pace compared to your peer group, or compared to what's required of different opportunities that are available to you. What I'd, I'd like to get from you last, if I could, is a sense of what can our students be doing now in order to prepare themselves for the strongest career launch that they can have and to launch themselves into a solid practice of career self-management uh, that will enable them to have a career that's satisfying and meaningful as they go uh, in their years past a deck. Um, perhaps Pierre-Antoine has a particular insight into this given his proximity to your own experience, and I'm sure everyone else has some great comments as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, the, the first thing to do is, um, I think, to try to diversify as much as possible your internship first during that period. It's very important that you uh, not only go from internship to another collectioning names of big companies like us or like when I say us it's not only all, all of us um, try to find um, uh, things uh, that are real content I know it's easier in my shoes than in yours uh, to say that because it's I know it's difficult to find good internship nowadays but nevertheless don't uh, don't miss the point. You have great value and you should, you should not give the edX value for nothing. Don't, don't accept anything just because there's a name on it. Uh, try to go to things that uh, uh, have some uh, uh, real interest for you. Um, and uh, it will be a, 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 great, uh, a great benefit. Uh, Something that really stuck out for me recently was a piece of research that showed that very broadly there are something like 1,500 or 1,500 different career paths that you can go down, different types of job families, different kinds of things that you can get involved in. And what was coming out from the research was that on average students are making decisions about <coughs> their baccalaureate or their A-levels in the UK or whatever it is they're doing at college, and then their first degree choice, they're doing that out of these 1,500 based on a very superficial knowledge of six to eight career paths, which is absolutely staggering when you think it through. And it means, and I've been thinking about this in respect of my own colleagues um, at work, if you take that through to its logical conclusion, probably everyone in the room is not doing the job that they could most happily do. It's a really bizarre way to look at it, but I think it has a lot of resonance. And the point, or the reason for mentioning that, is I think you all have a fabulous opportunity to actually find out more and more about the world of work just by doing something really simple, and that's by talking to people. 
I think that open mind piece is, is really key, um, especially um, we get a number of applications Actually, those that have also applied to the investment banks being a, a trading company. And actually, those that have just seen trading within the name and actually not necessarily understanding actually what it means to trade physical commodities, which is then significantly different to, uh, to what some of the banks are doing. So I would definitely say research is key. It's so, so important that you know about the organizations that you're actually applying to. And make sure that you use any interview um, interviews that you have or any opportunities like today to actually ask questions from the people that are actually already there. I always say interviews are a two-way process. It's as much about us finding out if you're right for us as you finding out if we're right for, for you as well. It's such a key um, point to go through. It should always be two ways there. Fantastic. Well, thank you very much. Uh, fantastic advice there for all of you to keep in mind. I heard a, a great phrase in addition to the lateral mindset. I heard a phrase from the founder of LinkedIn who said you should adopt a permanent beta mindset. Not beta, the finance term, but beta as we apply it to software in that you are permanently a work in progress and that your ability to adapt and to improve yourself is probably your key meta competency that's going to carry you through the rest of your career. So for those of you who can invest in developing career knowledge and self-knowledge now, it's going to pay off enormously for you. Don't think that, I know that your classes give you a lot of work, but you might want to treat your career development as an additional and possibly the most important class that you're enrolled in currently. Mm -hmm.